have you ever made the mistake of texting someone and you hit and send it to the wrong person? Have you ever emailed somebody and made the mistake and emailed it to the wrong person? Amen. That has caused a many a blunder in someone's life. I, I will look, I've realized that I have certain texts that say uh, David's on, Joseph's on, Richard Golightly's on, uh, Josiah Ramirez is on, and, I, and I'm going to just send a text to just one of them, but I, I hit it in the group text, and I may be talking about one of them to the other one. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble right there, Tommy. A sweet old couple from New York was about to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. They wanted to go to the same place they spent their honeymoon. So they checked, and the hotel was still there. There in Tampa, Florida. Well, he was a traveling salesman, and he arrived a day early. Amen, before his bride. He checked in and discovered this hotel now offered free Wi-Fi. Whew! He topped his wife a message. But being of the elderly age, he sent it to the wrong email address. Meanwhile, in Colorado... A woman returned home from her husband's funeral. She sat down and saw that she had a new email. She opened it, read it, and promptly fainted onto the floor. The email read, Hi, honey. I know you didn't expect to hear from me. But they have internet here, and you can send messages to your loved ones. When I checked in, I saw that you're scheduled to arrive tomorrow. Be sure to wear something cool because it's hot down here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Happy Valentine's Day. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 10, verse 25. I'm going to leave you sitting this morning because I've got a lot to read. Cuba, good to have you back in the house. Amen. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. What real love looks like. What real love looks like. And this is, when, when I first got into the house of God, I didn't really understand what real love was until I connected with Jesus. And if you're like me, you still find uh, there are times in life it's hard to be compassionate. And we're going to talk about the when and why of compassion. But on one occasion, an expert in the law, a lawyer, stood up to test Jesus, verse 25. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? How do you understand it? You know the whole issue of the Word of God is how do you understand it? How have you figured it out? Once you realize that the Bible is about a king, his kingdom, and his kids, the Bible starts opening up. Let me say it again. The king, his kingdom, and his kids. Once you figure that out, that it's a love letter to you, the Scripture comes alive for you. So he asked him, how do you read it? Well, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, Jesus said, well, there you go. You answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. He asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? Now, let's go back to what he said first off. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. He said, well, you know, I got that down. Love God with all your, your soul. Well, I think I got that down. Well, love God with all your strength. I think that I got that down. Love God with all your mind. But then he adds on to that, I love your neighbor as yourself. How many know it's one thing to say you love God, but it's another thing to say you love your neighbor? Woo! So he asked a question. Who, who, was, who is my neighbor? Amen. Love your neighbor yourself, Jesus said. He answered correctly. But he wanted to justify himself. He asked Jesus, and who was, is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, now, here you go. You had to ask the question, son, so I'm fitting to tell you. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So, too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Had compassion. The word pity is the word compassion on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And when he put the man on his own donkey, he took him to an inn to take care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper. He said, look after him, he said. See, compassion often will cost you. 
Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, well, the one who had mercy, compassion on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. I read this story to remind all of us that we are in a time and a period of our lives where compassion is what real love is. Amen. He, the scripture says he went down. He went down. That a certain man went down. Jesus explained it to him about neighbors. We don't know why this man went down to Jericho. The fact is he, was, he had his back turned to one place and his heart toward the other. Jerusalem was the center of worship. Jericho literally meant a curse. It was it would literally it was lured by fragrance. The road between uh, was steady, declined 18 miles winding down that led to the Dead Sea. Amen. The Dead Sea was a natural resource that went into the dead uh, uh, anything that went into the Dead Sea stayed there, the point of no return beyond our reach. The issue here is symbolic. You had one place that dealt with worship and another one that dealt with wickedness. And so he's heading down toward this place. He's got his back to it. And here's the thing about He said, this is your neighbor. Oftentimes we get frustrated with our neighbors. They may not do what we want them to do or act the way they want. And when I say neighbor, he's going to broaden this word just a little bit. It ain't just the one living next to you, but it's the people you run across in life. These are your neighbor. And we're at a moment in our nation that is deeply divided. Oh, it's divided. This White House uh, is, is such a mess. I, I don't know if you noticed it. I saw where President Trump, the former president, called Nancy Pelosi. And she answered the phone. And, and the question, when she answered it, she said, hello. And he said, this is Owen. And she said, Owen who? He said, Owen too. <laughs> so now we, we got a smart aleck old president, a sleepy new president, and a White House that is totally divided. Some of y'all ain't going to get anything I just said right there. But, 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 but the bottom line is I thank God for the conservatism that we came out of. Amen. And whatever we got to endure to get back to it, we're going to do it. Can I get an amen? We'll, we'll get back to it. But when I see the Dead Sea, everything flowed into the Dead Sea and nothing came out. Everything floats on the Dead Sea. There's, there's no refreshing there. And in this time of being divided in our nation, we disagree with each other. Across the political spectrum, we're beginning to realize that what is wrong with America is moral and spiritual. I think people are beginning to see that it is going to take much more than just money to rebuild our cities, to rebuild our homes, our families, our marriages, to preserve our children to the next generation. We need a, a new birth of compassion. to have. Because the bottom line is, if we get calloused about it, we get frustrated with, with neighbors or people we know that keep heading down, or backsliding, or moving back, and, and it just bothers us. And we, and we forget that, you know, God, if it wasn't for your grace and mercy, that's where we would go, that you've held us. The word compassion is defined, amen, means to suffer with another person. The word has a strong personal element. It's real love. When Noah Webster published an American dictionary in the English language in 1828, he began his definition of compassion this way. A suffering with another, painful sym uh, sym sympathy. Painful sympathy. Amen. It's illustrated when in Luke 15, 20, the father saw him, felt and had compassion, and he ran and embraced the prodigal son, and he kissed him. It's about a dad in love with his children. And even though the kid has been bad and done the wrong thing, the dad can't help himself. He, you know, he's had the tough love. He, he sent the kid out, but the kid came back, and he has a sympathy. I don't know why I want to say a symphony, a sympathy for the child, and he kills the fatted calf. He has a party. Amen. He throws it down. So it's more than feeling sorry for people in trouble. Biblical compassion, love, means that you see the problem, you're moved by the need, you go out to where the problem is, and you get your hands dirty trying to help one person after another get their problem solved and raise them up to a higher level of life. And if we can have this kind of compassion in the church, amen, first, because believe it or not, guys, this is not going to start in the White House house. This got to start in the church house. Amen. Amen. When I read Jesus, Matthew 14, 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. This is during the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children. Compassion moved him. Jesus had, had this desire. He had, a, again, painful 
sympathy, amen, that he wanted to help them. More fish and bread and various miracles. In Matthew 15, 32, Jesus called his disciples. He said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days. They've hung out with me. They have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. This love that we see, this mushy love that we, we, we pick up on, even on days like today, doesn't even compare to what Jesus had. On 5,000 men and women and children, when he took a little boy's sack lunch of fish and bread and broke them and blessed them, Jesus felt the same compassion on another crowd. Actually, we know that he fed 5,000 here. You know, in another place, he fed 4,000. Amen. He just didn't stop with the miracles in one place. He did it again. In Matthew chapter 20, we read that there were two blind men of Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were there sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? Last week, I told you about blind Bartimaeus. Remember blind Bartimaeus? He did the same thing. Mercy, have mercy on me. And Jesus asked the same question. What do you want me to do for you? And, and then, you know, again, it's obvious that you're blind, you want to have sight. He had this painful sympathy for them. He had compassion on them because they said, we want our sight. And so he touched their eyes immediately and they received their sight and they followed him. Just like blind Bartimaeus, they turned around. Compassion has this ability that once you connect with people, watch this, once you connect with them, and once you love them through the unlovable times, and when you've done something for them, hallelujah, they want to connect with you. Because now it's going to reciprocate. It's going to come back. These men followed him. And then we'd read that being filled with compassion, Mark chapter 1, verse 40. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with, say it again, come on. Compassion is love in action. It's when, when love kicks in and says, you know what? I, 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 it's more than feelings. I got to do something with it. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. If you're just some novice reading the word of God, you'll miss this. The bottom line here is he touched him. He touched a leper. It's the most shocking part of the text. Amen. In doing that, he broke all the customs and rules of that day. According to the Old Testament, if you had leprosy, you were unclean. People were so scared of lepers that they made them live in a colony. They isolated them. They quarantined them from the rest of society. They would not contaminate anyone else. But when Jesus saw the man with leprosy, he was moved with compassion. He reached out and he touched him. Again, Compassion was not a feeling. It was a commitment to get involved with hurting people. We're living in a time and a day when our government and, and the medical world is saying, stay away from people six foot away. I'm telling you something different. I'm telling you people need to touch. I'm I don't care if you've got to put gloves on and a mask on to do it, but touch them if that's what you feel. I have laid hands on more COVID people than you can. That I can't even. I, can't, I, I would hurt your feelings. You wouldn't even shake my hand. If you knew how many people I've prayed for that's had this virus, that has recovered from this virus. Amen. And yet, here I stand. I have no symptoms. I get up every morning. <laughs> I taste that coffee. Amen. I enjoy that. that uh, what's that this morning I had? Oatmeal cookie. Cream filled. What they call it? Little Debbie. Yeah, I had me a little Debbie cream. Yeah. My son-in-law actually bought me some oatmeal. Uh, what's it called again? Cream pot? Go back oatmeal cream pot. Cereal. They got a cereal with them little bitty suckers in there. Amen. Now, I haven't touched it yet because I'm trying to watch my weight. But I can feel a moment of just kind of sliding back a little, seeing what that going to taste like. Hallelujah. Because I, I, I like that cinnamon toast crunch too, you know. Don't go buy me any, okay? I say stuff like that and folks start buying me stuff. I got it. I can take care of that. The bottom line is Jesus touched him. Well, everybody else would stay away from a leper that cried out. He touched him. Amen. And drove the sickness from him. Now, I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to go be foolish. But I'm telling you that and not about everybody that jumps in your way you need to help. But every now and then God puts somebody in your way. 
And that's the ones I want to help. I don't go out of my way all the time to find somebody. That's not what I'm doing here. Now, if it's, a, it's, if it's one that leaves a 99, that's different. But in life, I want you to know that this is illustrated. Luke chapter, excuse me, Acts chapter 10, verse 38. One sentence summarized the whole ministry of Jesus. Amen. You know, we're used to thinking of Jesus as the Son of God, and so he was. But I call your attention here to what Peter said. He went about doing good and healing all who are repressed by the devil, for God was with him. When you know that God is with you, and you know this is a God thing and not a Jerry thing. Amen. That God has put you in this place, and he, he's filled you with faith for something. Amen. That's your moment for understanding, I'm going to whoop that devil today. Amen. I want to heal people. I want to believe God for healing. Amen. I'm going to do that. We need a new birth of compassion, of, of real love. Most of us would not react kindly if someone called us a do-gooder. But do you know Jesus was a do-gooder? He always went around doing good. Amen. Don't let somebody put you in a box and say, well, you just a good do-gooder. Say, well, yes, I am. I'm going to try to do as much good as I can for people as long as I'm on this earth. Amen. So here's the question again. Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? In one sense, the question seems to answer itself. Just look around. Your neighbors are all around you. They live on your street, on your road. They go to the school with you. Amen. You shop at the same stores with them. You eat at the same restaurants with them. You drive, amen, around with them. You work with your neighbors. You see them when you go to church. Your neighbors are there. Simple answer, so it would seem. But buried within this deep theological question, all the Jews knew that God commanded his people to love him with a whole heart but Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, adds an important application. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. And I'm going to tell you what you did for self this morning. You got up and you washed self. You brushed self teeth. Amen. You combed self hair. You sprayed self hair, those who have self hair. Amen. You took care of self. You said to yourself, self, I want a cup of coffee. Hallelujah. You took care of self. You ate a donut this morning. You took care of self. Now he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Love them. Amen. Like that. Care for them. Jesus said there was once a man that was on the road, went from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Thieves fell upon him, beat him, stripped him, robbed him, left him for dead. And before too long, a priest, a minister of God, came by, saw the poor man living there. And the priest walked on the other side. He wouldn't even have to get involved. He had to get to the temple. A few minutes later, Levi came by, a theologian, a doctor of theology, a student of God's word, a man who was supposed to know the character of God. Amen. When the Levite saw the man lying there on the side of the road, he crossed to the other side. Side. Same attitude. So he wouldn't have to bother with him. He was already late for his weekly Torah discussion meeting. The robber spirit, and that's what it was, they beat this man. Amen. They say, what's yours is mine. This is the devil. No real love here. Amen. They beat him and left him there. He was going down. Robbers are always looking to take from you. There's a religious spirit that says, what's mine is mine. That's what these guys thought. I've, I've studied all these years to get this theology. Amen. I ain't got time to mess with you. I'm going to keep right on walking. Keep I don't move it. What's mine is mine. The priest had no interest in the man. Amen. In fear and knowing the man had been beaten, passed by on the other side. The opposite of love, my friend, is not apathy. The opposite of love is not hate, my bad, but apathy. There, that's the right way to say it. Amen. It's not hate. And people say, well, say, no, no, apathy just says I don't care. I just don't care. Amen. The Levite did the same. Levites were very religious, conservative about the law, made sure people lived by statutes. And I meet church folk that are that way. That's why I tell you, I'm not going to sit here and take, teach you how to do certain things in life. You're going to have to decide morally what's right for you. Amen. You've got to decide that according to the Word of God. The Scripture says you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. You take care of that. So it, the, the Levite had no compassion. He walked by on the other side. To offer only curious concern only adds insult to the pain. But, you know, if, if I ask you what's wrong and you tell me, I need to be ready to act or either keep my mouth shut and not ask you. There are people in my life, I never ask them anymore what's wrong because they always tell me. They always tell. You just look on Facebook. They, I'll be honest. There's certain folk I go and just check out and see what's, what's wrong today. Because the only reason they're on social media is let you know what's wrong with them today. Amen. So I, let's go check it out. Soon after, he came to a Samaritan. And this is, the, this is the crux here. This is the race issue. Jesus threw the race card down. Mm-hmm. See, a Jew asked him. And Jesus said, a certain Samaritan. See, some folk got this black-white hate. They got this uh, uh, yellow-brown hate. They got all, but to the Jew, 
the worst thing you could ever be was a Samaritan. Amen. I mean, they looked at them as dogs. And here's Jesus, a Jew, talking to a Jew, telling the Jew that a certain Samaritan went down. Boy, he just threw it right in his face. In other words, uh, love, love literally is blind. Compassion is blind. It don't care if you're black, white, yellow, brown, blue, purple, or what. Amen. It, it's compassion. It says, I want to bless you. I want to help you. I remember when uh, my wife and I at the time adopted my daughter Mandy. I literally, honest to God, when I was called about this little girl to adopt her after being married nine years, I never asked what color is she. When I got there, they actually questioned me. Why didn't you ask us of the race of the baby you're going to adopt? And my question, well, my answer was, I didn't care. Amen. I, I'm going to love this girl no matter what. Now, I didn't know she bald-headed and white, but, but I got her just like that. Amen. I had to put a bow on her head for people to understand this is a girl, not a little boy. But she act like a little boy. She'll whoop you like a boy. She's still like that today. Amen. But she got long hair and pretty. You know, they would never say anything good about them. The Jews hated Samaritans. But Jesus said, th th said this half-breed that you would call him. This mixed breed, the hated Samaritan, came along and saw that poor man lying there. And when he found out that he was still alive, he took his wine and poured it on his wounds. He dressed his wounds. He picked the man up. He put him on his own donkey. He took him to the inn. He paid the proprietor. Amen. He stayed the night with the man. Amen. Looking after him. And the next morning, he took money out of his own pocket, gave it to the innkeeper, and said, if there's more, please understand, I'll settle the bill with you later when I come back. And understand this, again, prophetically, that one, one coin represented one day. And one day to the Lord is a thousand years. So two coins would be two thousand years. And he said, when I come back again, if there's more I got to do, I'll settle up with you. Amen. I'll take care of you. I believe he's coming back again. Can you get an amen? So let me make two observations about this story as I begin to close here. First is long closing, Joseph. First... What the Samaritan did was truly above and beyond normal human obligations. Today, if we saw a beaten man lying on the road, we would first call 911, wouldn't we? Amen. We would make that call. Amen. And, then, and do what we could while we waited for help to arrive. But there were no EMTs on the treacherous road winding down the mountain from Jerusalem to Jericho. If this man were to survive, a Samaritan would have to take the whole burden on himself. Either we get involved or the man dies. There were no other options. He had to do something. Amen. Seen in the light, many of us might have hesitated. After all, we, we got things to do. We got places to go. We got people to see. I don't know anyone who isn't busy these days. Everybody is busy. B-U-S-Y. Being under Satan's yoke. Always busy. Amen. Always got something to do. And even if you ain't, you lie about it. So they won't ask you to help them with anything. Amen. These days, the demands of life, they lie heavily upon us. And you can't save the world. You just can't. You can't save everybody. I know at times when, when people get born again or they have a real uh, spiritual moment, they get a savior mentality. Amen. They're going to save the whole world. They're going to go after it. You can't rescue every baby. I found that out. Can't do it. You, you can't save every marriage. You can't help every homeless person. But if God puts someone in your path, not someone who jumped in your path, but truly in your path, that very well could be a divine appointment. Amen. you got to light a candle there in the darkness. It's not a matter of being busy. It's a matter of preparation. It's about being effective, amen, with your day. You only got so many hours to be awake during the day. Be effective during that time. I suppose one could argue that his background as an outcast made him more likely to respond to human needs. Amen. I've been put down as Samaritan. I've been put down as, as my race. I've been put down by my culture. And I see a man hurting and because I've been put down, amen, I understand that pain, that hurt. And I'm going to help this man who's been beat up. Compassion moved him to action. At that particular moment, this particular Samaritan saw this man robbed, beaten, left for dead. And he decided, I'm going to get involved. And in our own life, we meet people have gone through the same pain we've gone through. Amen. Struggle with the same stuff we've gone through. And we want to help them at that. The only decision he had to make was, should I get involved or not? Years ago, there was a hurricane that hit uh, New Orleans called Katrina. When that New Orleans, when it was hit, we had an opportunity with a camp and a facility. And a friend of mine was moving through New Orleans and he called me. He said, Pastor, I have never seen nothing like this in my life. There are people sitting on the hot asphalt on I-10, and their homes are flooded and destroyed. Some of them have vehicles, and some of them don't. Can I bring some of them to the ranch? And because of that, I told Rodney, go ahead and bring them. 
Now, what I didn't realize, that was 16 families that showed up that needed a place to stay. And some of you remember this. And they came in with their dogs. I remember we were cooking ribeye steaks that day. And when they showed up, I started cutting them ribeye steaks in half and quarters. Fed everybody that came in. Amen. Loved on them. They showed up. Again, we had to find dog pens for them. Some of them showed up with criminal records. I didn't know that. Because when you rescue people, you don't ask them first about their background. You don't ask them first, uh, do, do, you, do you love God? Are you a racist? Are, are you wicked? Are you mean? Are you a Democrat? <laughs> didn't ask them. I promise you, most of them were. We put them on the property. We put mailboxes up for them. We looked after them. One couple showed up. I didn't ask them. They showed up as a couple. I thought they were married. No, they were just living together. And I had, I had people literally get upset with me. Pastor, you're letting them folk live together down there. Yeah, they showed up that way. I've run out of buildings to put folk in. They were already living together. So, yeah, I, I did that. I let them live together. But in seven days, we married them. Now, you tell me that ain't God. I remember his name was Guy. Her name was Rose. It was an amazing thing that we saw compassion. We couldn't rescue everybody out of New Orleans. But those that God put in our path, we did. And we looked after them. We started what is known as the clothing ministry of the little country church. There was no clothing ministry then. But we started it. It filled the chapel up with clothes. Amen. People were coming and getting close. And it's, it's been going on since, what was that? 2008, 2010. I forget when it was. Amen. But it's still going on. Still happening today. You know, we rarely know what compassion will demand of us. That is why we ought not to be overly calculating before you get involved. Here's the thing. Sometimes the help we give will be brief and easy to do. Other times we discover the demands are long lasting. You know, some of them families stayed four months. I finally had to say, y'all got to go. And that's a hard thing to do. But there are times you've got to say, look, I've helped you best I can do. All I can. Now you've got to go help yourself. Amen. I got you through that moment. Most of the time, we can't do it all by ourselves. Even in this story, the Samaritan didn't stick around to try to nurse the man back to health. Amen. He left him in the care of somebody else. Amen. In an inn, and he went his way. He didn't stay with him the whole time. God may not demand you to stay with somebody the whole time. Maybe, maybe you just wanted to get it started. But I'm telling you, if we're going to turn some things around in America, we've got to find out who our neighbor is. We've got to love them. Amen. Real love, this February the 14th, 2021, demands for us to be more like Jesus. Amen. To reach out and to touch them. Which of these was the true neighbor to the man in need? The priest, the Levite, the Samaritan? You know, it's a Samaritan. Then Jesus said, go and do likewise. The bonus is always on me. I'm able to tell the story about Katrina, and I could tell you another hundred stories about what this church has done for people over and over and over and over again with compassion. The bonus is on me. When you get to do that, it's like, praise the Lord. Amen. I, I was doing something biblical. Hallelujah. But the bonus is, but not, not on those in need. Sometimes you say, you bless them. Uh-uh. I was the one that got blessed. Amen. Because I got to bless them. Ble you know, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's not about the man in the need. I promise you, they'd have rather been in my shoes than in their shoes. It's all about those who had a chance to help and didn't. And the one man who did what he could, even though he could have walked away, compassion was applied. Now, I'm going to give you a few words in closing about real love. First, we need to pray aggressively. When we pray for Pat Sharp, it's aggressive. Kent Brown, it's aggressive. When we pray for people, be aggressive about it. Amen. When Jesus said to two blind men, what is it you want? He asked a question because we need to answer that. God, this is what I want. I want health until the day I die. I want a heads up. I told God this. Give me a heads up. Don't take me out of here too quickly. Give me about 10 minutes, 5 minutes. I'll just a heads up before I get out of here. I just want to know. If I'm on my Harley, just give me a heads up. I, want to say, I just want to know. I just want to be able to talk to you one more time on the earth before I get to the kingdom of God. Amen. Be specific in your prayers when you pray for one another. And be aggressive. Be aggressive. The scripture says the violent take it by force. Sometimes we're so passive. Lord, if you will. Lord, if you can. What do you mean, Lord, if you can? I've heard people pray that way. If he can, miracles come in cans, not cannots. 
Amen. I know God can. Everything's possible with him. It's possible to restart, amen, my financial blessings in my life, ministry in my life, amen, business in my life, relationships in my life. It's possible. So if it's possible, let me pray that way. Be more aggressive about it. History tells us that every revival has been preceded by fervent, united, praying among believers. God will not put a fire in anything that the wood ain't first laid on the, on the, under the fire. And that's what prayer does. The spiritual and moral decay in our culture has brought us to a point of de desperation. And now our desperation has become the greatest ally. Amen. It's when I'm hungry. It's when I'm thirsty that I get desperate after God. Amen. And that's when we start to seek Him. When you pray for your spouse, when you, when you stand in the gap for your children, when you see God's face for your pastor, when you pray earnestly for your friends, when you bring your neighbors before the Lord, but God, I know they're falling back, they're heading down. That's when I need to pray for them the most. When you pray for your missionaries around the world, when you lift up leaders of government, that's what Jesus told us to do. Second, you need to be radically personal. Now, I, I, you be, Tommy, you and I got a friend who absolutely despises hugging and greeting in church. I'll tell you who he is later. You might already guess. Now, I've seen him comment about it. He's a, he's a minister. But in my heart, I believe we need to hug, to shake hands, to touch, to greet. And if you don't like it, just throw your fingers up like that when I come near you. Hey, man, I'll back away. I ain't got to touch it. But I believe in radical, personal con connection and contact. Amen. I believe it's healing. That's why I say the hospital thing right now is so, uh, is, it has to be so, it's a paradox. I know that they feel like we need to stay away so we don't bring anything in. But if I ain't got no temperature, if I can taste, smell, if I can do all that, like y'all say that that's what this thing does, let me go in and touch people. I mean, don't let them die alone. Don't let them die without their friends being near them and their family being able to touch them. Amen. So when I go out to help somebody, I want to connect with them. Amen. I want to do so. I'll mow their grass. You've heard me talk about mowing people's grass. You know, some of you know that I drive a purple uh, Challenger, a 71. It's 50 years old. And the ashes of that, of the man that owned it, are in the car. Amen. Because that's because he wanted to ride in the car. But he never got to ride in it. It, was, uh, it needed to be restored. I restored it and put him in there. But what you may not know is when he was drunk and on his way to Jericho, I was over there mowing his grass. I'd bring a mower over and I'd mow his grass. He, he would wake up from being passed out, call me up, Preacher! Did you mow my grass? Well, who else you know going to mow your grass, Rodney? Why are you mowing my grass? Because your grass needed mowing. Hey, man, you're a bad example to your neighbors not mowing your grass. Mow your grass. The other reason is because I love you. I didn't do that to get his car. I didn't even know he owned that car. I didn't care. My, my heart was toward him. I loved him. Amen. It's important to be radical about that, to connect. Amen. And the last point, we need to begin this week. You got to begin this week. This is a great week to reach to your neighbor, to give them a call, to call. I'm not talking about the one that just lives next door. I'm just talking about people that you know. Hey, are you going to be warm enough? Do you have bread, milk, toilet paper? No greater love than this than for somebody to give up their Charmin. Amen. We're in that place in life. Hallelujah. And I know some of you have hoarded it. And some of you have been hoarding bullets because I can't find any to buy. May I suggest many of us would like a personal ministry, but we don't know where to begin. Jesus gave you that ministry when he gave you that neighbor. I'm asking God to give us the eyes of a missionary for those people that are around us. How do you change the world, Pastor? Not through programs. Not, not even through preaching done from a distance. You change the world one heart at a time, one life at a time. Compassion that isn't personal isn't compassion amen god help us to be men and women of compassion to reach out and touch a hurting world in jesus name my friend that's real love hallelujah heads bowed eyes closed those watching online listen to the preacher now real love looks like touching the leper touching the blind not just talking to them but touching them reaching out and connecting defeating the devil that's what real love looks like. I'm praying in the name of Jesus for a spirit of compassion to fall upon the body of believers of the little country church and those that are watching us online that God would bless, strengthen, and help you. 
that not just people that jump in your life. There's always somebody trying to jump in your life. But that God would put a divine appointment. Amen. And you connect with them. And when you do, that lives are changed in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. Happy Valentine's Day. Please be careful who you email and text. Can I share something with you? Um, before you give today, amen, and I want to thank those who are giving toward our live stream to make that possible. Still getting some checks in the mail and those that are giving toward that. It is an expensive venue, but it's important for us to do. But last week was my birthday, and you guys showered me with cards and blessings. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, you're talking about overwhelm. It should never happen again until my 65th or 70th, if I make it that long. Don't do that every year. I can't take it. I can't take it. That, that was overwhelming. It really was. Both campuses. But something happened in the North Campus that didn't happen here. And the reason it did, Lord bless them. The reason it did is because of the emotional toll it could have took on me had it been shown here. I may not have been able to preach there. So my wife and staff all decided, let's show this there. And this was men and women speaking on my behalf. And, uh, and it's not to flaunt who I am, but, and I will mention who these people are. Some were missionaries, some were friends. But the one that got me was Bishop Miller. Tony Miller was my friend and someone I looked to as a father figure. Not that, I mean, he was closer to David and Tony. That's where I found David and Tony was Bishop Miller's church. But he, he sat down and sent me a birthday greeting. Now, I listened to all of it last night. There's 30 minutes of this stuff, amen, from people. And uh, um, so they had to splice it just to get it into this few minutes that you're going to see. But when I saw Tony's face, knowing that he recorded this on a Monday and he died on a Tuesday, I knew this was one of the last recordings of a man that had preached in 70 nations, that had around 300 churches that looked to him as a father figure and a bishop and who was over Destiny Outreach and pastored a church of 2,000 people. And he sat down, and he talked about me. When I saw it, I lost it last week. So I thank God this was not shown here last week. But I want you to see it. Because some of you are going to remember comedian Mike Warnke. You're going to hear Pastor Kenneth share one of the dumbest poems you've ever heard. You're, you're, you're going you're to see a, a one-eyed Eddie B. If you remember Eddie B., you're going to see him with one eye talking... These guys were hilarious. Uh, Bishop Gary Oliver is going to talk. Pastor Rick Hawkins and my pastor, Mike Van Britson, so eloquently shared. Would you show that, Mike? Amen. Turn that volume up. Oh, uh, you know who that is. To you, happy birthday, Pastor Jerry. Happy birthday. David so many things changing. One thing never changes. My pastor, and that's Mike. That's our love and respect for you. Uh, and so we pray a rich, happy birthday for you. God bless you, your family, and your church. See you soon. And you're a good man, and I thank God for our, our friendship. Bishop Gary, um, I wish you a very, very happy birthday today. And uh, may this season of your life be the best season you've ever experienced. Hey, my friend Jerry's having a birthday. Dallas. Hey, you remember when you were 22? Or how about 35? Or how about 38? Maybe 40? Or 44? How about 45? 50? 58. I'm out of calibers. Happy 60th birthday, my brother. God bless you. Sure, I'm glad you're my friend. Happy birthday, Brother Jerry. It's Pastor Mark Grimes. I love you so much. I remember the first time I met you, Man, two things I took away from that meeting. 
number one, you love big dogs and so do I. So I copied you and got my own. Me and Fork wish you a happy birthday. Hey, Pastor, just wanted to say thank you so much. My family and I are so grateful that you took a chance on us, that we've been able to be here and to serve you in the Little Country Church. You've been both pastor and papa to my family. We absolutely adore you. We love you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday pastor. pastor, for the Walter family. We love you so much. Uh, six years, pretty close to now, six years ago, you took a chance on me. And I'll forever be grateful for that. Happy birthday, son. It's my mama. I love you. Happy birthday, Uncle Jerry. Hey there, Pastor Jerry. This is Priscilla, wishing you a happy, happy birthday. We bought the to camp. One of my favorite son in this house was. from the deal. Happy birthday from Ma and Pa Kettle from Utah. Jerry, if I had to look all over the world to find someone good enough to marry my daughter, I'd pick you. Hey, brother. Comedian Mike Warnke. Just dropping by to wish you a happy birthday. 60 years old. My, my, my. I bet you if you'd known you were going to live this long, you'd have treated yourself better when you were younger. Happy birthday, Pastor, Pastor Jerry. Pastor Lee Short, missionary. Pastor Jerry, welcome to the Old Far Club. Lady you are now an official member. It's a good club, so enjoy it. Pastor Jerry, I'm a mess. Lenora Purvis. I had no idea. I just found out. Heaven's Army. You're returning 60. Wow. We need to inform the world. The world needs to know that a great man is 60. I was preaching at a friend's church, and Jerry Bishop had been Tony there as Miller. well. And I, I thought we had returned. I thought somebody had actually come in maybe from a Wild West show that needed to get saved. I didn't know who it was. Wyatt Earp had walked in. Somebody walked in the door. And uh, so when I gave the altar call, I kept watching for this guy to come. And after church, they told me he was a pastor. And I went, no, you're kidding. Happy birthday. You're 60 and I'm not. Love you, brother. Thanks for the truck back. That's my brother. Happy birthday, Jerry. But I just wanted to wish you a very happy birthday there, old man. Hi, Pastor oh, Jerry. David we Blackburn, best friend. Wanted to wish you happy birthday. Josiah and Ramirez, many blessings mom and dad. To you this year. We love you. Same here, Pastor Jerry. We love you and, um, we wish you a Merry Christmas. No. <laughs> hey, Jerry, we love you out here in Kerrville, Texas. We're living our Chuck best. Chuck Bergen, Kerrville. Son, we just wanted to tell you happy birthday. We hope you have a wonderful week and a great birthday. This is, this is Pastor Jerry's birthday. Eddie B. Don't tell anybody, everybody. New Mexico. But I think he's getting old. Yotak Aitato Nita, Pastor Jerry. Just to tell you, brother, I love you. That's happy birthday in Choctaw. I'm trying to learn the language by time, huh? Just wanted to say a big Pastor Rich happy Amador. birthday. Pastor Richard Amador, this is happy Joey Hughes, his wife. We love you very much. Oh, and I got one more thing. To Oklahoma say. City. Thank you for my cup. <laughs> I've known Jerry Hovetter since. He was a youth pastor in Channel View. Field medals. Had a ministry called Bragg, being radical about God. I was impressed then, and I'm still impressed with Jerry Hovetter. Pastor Jerry, happy birthday from Pastor Dustin and I. We want you to know how much we love you, man. Red you have Hawkins. stood with me as a covenant brother. Listen to this. Since 1984, my brother, I drove up on the International Bible College campus First guy I met was an Alabama Crimson Tide, Roll Tide guy. Hey, my brother. Ken Holloway. Some little bird Tom. told me this year that you're turning 60. Wow, wow. Been doing this a long time, brother. Listen, this white hair right here, I color mine white. It's really like jet black. I color white, kind of said it looks good, so. Jerry, happy birthday. It's the elder family. Yeah, bless you. I love their daughter's response. Happy birthday to you. We love you. God bless you and happy birthday. Bishop. And it's still Brooks. pecan, it's not pecan. Bye. <laughs> Reverend Holy Wild. Gun toting. Motorcycle riding. Gary Oliver. 
deer hunting, fish catching, wild horse riding preacher. Oh, to Pastor Jerry. Kenneth. There once was a lad named Jerry Hovatter. He grew up on Wheeler Mountain. His life did not seem to matter. Rum runners and bootleggers, they were his clan. Bless his heart. It's not his fault. He's an Alabama football fan. He struck out in life for God he did search. And he ended up in Texas with the little country church. He's not very handsome, kind of tall and hairy, but somehow he convinced pretty Miss Lord to marry. He preaches the word with zeal and fire. It's amazing how he never, ever seems to tire. Some people turn 60 and they don't have a plan, but I bet Pastor Jerry does because he's the man. <laughs> Hey, we have to say happy birthday to your daddy. Baby, I just wanted you to know that we love you so much and you are loved by so many. Have a great, great birthday. All right, there you go. Pretty good. <clears throat> There's some that, that, that were on there that didn't turn out real good. David Hilton sent me one. Jimmy Smith sent me one, others. But I was laughing at Mark Grimes. You know what Mark Grimes said? There are two things that he learned from me. One was to have a big dog, and then it cut off. So I wonder what the second one was. Then I, then I saw it last night. Uh, that, I, that I cussed in church, and it kind of gave him permission to go ahead and cuss too. So that, that probably not the best thing you learned from me. David, come on up here, man. If you have your offering there, prepare it. Amen. Uh, Travis will be in the back if you pick it up. And on your way out, uh, there's several announcements that need to be made here. And uh, get a little bit later. But thanks for indulging me on that right there. And then again, uh, Bishop Miller's was a lot longer than that. And I had the joy of having these with me now. And uh, they, they're quite, uh, some of them quite humorous how we all met over the years. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Grateful for our pastor. Uh, January 14th, which is today, no, it should be February 14th, anyway, February 14th, swap meeting, today after church, but it's also the second Sunday every month, see Miss Linda and Ken, if you guys want to do that, uh, February 21st, Lift Bible Study, Ladies in Fellowship Together, it's the third Sunday every month, see Diane Phelan for details, the 21st, TLCC Kids Bake Sale, support the TLCC Kids Nose Ark Mission Trip, uh, bring baked goods to sell next Sunday and or buy some baked goods next Sunday. Support our kids. See Rhea or Jody for details or questions. Anything you want to say about that? Is there, is there any kind of specifics on whatever? No edibles? <laughs> Good. <laughs> sugar free some of them could be sugar free it's okay some some people are good with that i just got to specify in church you know this one you, you got to make that very clear <laughs> i love that h is just looking at me right now he's like yeah, true story <laughs> anyway bless him lord uh february 27th ladies ministry hosting scavenger hunt um the tlcc ladies hosting the citywide scavenger hunt and this isn't just for ladies the ladies are hosting it but it's for the whole family miss cheryl i know you're here anything you want to add to that Amen. Right, right. This is in place more or less of the uh this is in place of the Valentine's banquet that we normally put on every year in February, but this year we're going to do it uh just with families, which is fun. Fellowship. And we're not going to have to be right on top of each other to do it so that it's more COVID friendly. You get in your own car, you get in your car and you go find stuff. Oh, I like that. Maybe I'll be here. I'm in. Uh, so, th again, in $10 family. Oh, per person. Okay, $10 a person. I don't, not, sorry about that. For food and prizes. Perfect. 
All right, and that will be February 27th. March 2nd and 3rd, first week midweek service. Uh, Gaster, um, Pastor Rick Hawkins actually will be here next month on the first um, on the midweek service. He's a fantastic speaker, guys. This, it will be a, a really good time. And he's, he's country, so, you know, it's always nice to hear from uh, Pastor Rick. Um, he tries not to be, tries to be real distinguished now, but he, it come out. He can't help himself. <laughs> He's got way too much Louisiana in him for that to hide too much. Uh, and again, uh, tomorrow or on Tuesday night, it, it is scheduled to have youth, but that will be tentative based on weather, obviously. No sense in getting out if it's going to be crazy. Uh, two or more is the same. So, Okay. Okay, yeah, and that's basically what I'm going to do. I'm going to let my kids know. The, uh, on two or more, which is the prayer meeting we have every Tuesday night, um, that will be tentative as well. But he's going to let you know via Facebook, however else he can get a hold of you, if, email, whatever. Okay. Okay, sign up in the back for the scavenger hunt, and that's just so that they know how much food to buy, how many prizes to have, so that we're not, like, just sitting there, you know. It makes sense. I appreciate that. Anything else? Once? Twice? Awesome. All right, look, I, I'm, I'm excited about being in this church, guys. You know, we watch this thing, and, and there's, there's pastors from all over the world that chime in, people from all over the world that have been blessed by our pastor. Yeah, he talks about Bishop and how Bishop went, but, you know, our pastor does the same thing. You know, there's people all over the world that are really grateful and and owe a lot to pastor for the fact that they're in ministry now and that they're doing things uh those letters that you guys gave to him they mean something they're gonna last a long time you know heaven forbid we have another flood and he loses some of them but other than that uh you know those things they last forever and those memories you don't lose that you know those are the things you may forget what your dog's name was when you were little, but the things that age says about pastor, the things that Tommy says about that my wife, whenever you don't forget those things, man, and they don't go away. So it's it's good to encourage your pastor. Continue just to let him know how much you love him. We don't have to wait for his birthday to bless him. Amen. We don't have to wait for his birth. And and the same. That's how I feel about Valentine's Day. If my wife only knows I love her on Valentine's Day, we're doing something wrong. Amen. We, don't, we shouldn't have to have a day for us to be able to tell our loved ones that we love them. Amen? We should be able to do that all year long, and this is just one of those days that we get to highlight that. Amen? Father's Day, Mother's Day, all these things. Look, those are just commercialized days so that somebody can make some money off of it. But the reality is we should be doing this all year long. Amen? Today we're believing God for... Jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates in return, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Bless you guys this week. We love you. Have an awesome week. Get your kids.